Well, terrific. Today we're going to be talking about the rise of Hitler. Last time it was the rise of Stalin. Today we're going to be talking about developments in post-war Germany. One of the things I didn't really talk much about last time, but that's important to realize how it was possible for devils such as Stalin and Hitler to take power in major countries of the world, is that after the First World War, all of the major powers were exhausted. The last thing they wanted was another conflict. And so, really, not only force, but even the threat of force were things that they wanted to stay away from. Churchill was one of the few figures who said at a very early stage, something ought to be done about the Russian Revolution, something ought to be done about the rise of Hitler. But he was a lone and unpopular figure for saying that. Most people thought that Europe had just been through a horrendously severe conflict. No one wanted to get involved in another war, especially one based on speculation about what certain people would do in the future. So let's talk about the roots of aggression that would lead to the Second World War. At the end of the First World War, Germany was a mess. Already by October, so before the armistice was signed on November 11th, in October of 1918, the country came very close to a communist revolution. There was fighting in the streets, there was an attempt at revolution, uh, especially workers in the port city of Kiel led this effort, but it was something that echoed in a variety of uh, German cities. Uh, and there was significant support for the communists in the assembly. So it could easily have happened that Germany went the way of Russia and also was facing a communist overthrow in 1918, just a year after it happened in Russia. But the moderates did manage to get the upper hand of the assembly and so were able to contain the immediate threat. However, fighting against radical groups and one radical group against another continued for some time. So at the end of the war, Germany was highly unstable. People were starving. There was not enough to eat. The Allies kept up their blockade until 1919, when finally the terms of the Treaty of Versailles were signed. That was part of the way they were putting pressure on Germany. As many as half a million Germans may have died of starvation during that winter between 1918 and 1919. Now here you can see the workers unrest, people in the streets, um, in October of 1918. The German government really didn't have much of a choice in either ending the war or then later agreeing to the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. What was established by the treaty was something known as the Weimar Republic. Weimar was declared the new capital of Germany. It was a constitutional republic, no longer a monarchy, as the previous government had been under the rule of the Kaiser. But the Weimar Republic was doomed in various ways. <laughs> One, it was viewed by Germans themselves as having been born in defeat. It was a form of government not actually chosen by the German people, but imposed on them from the outside. That made it unpopular from the very beginning. So from the Allies' point of view, they were doing something wonderful. They were bringing freedom and democracy and human rights and so on to Germany, but the Germans themselves didn't see it that way. This was something that was being imposed on them from the outside. Secondly, the first act of this republic was signing the Treaty of Versailles. There had to be a government that actually agreed to the treaty, and this was it. So the Allies set up a government, and then that government agreed to allow the Allies to set it up and so on. It all had this weirdly circular appearance and seemed to the German people themselves to be illegitimate. In any case, the Treaty of Versailles is now recognized, at least, uh, and was recognized by many people at the time, as really setting up the conditions for future instability in Europe. Now, why? Well, here you see the Grand Hall of Versailles. You see people gathered for the treaty. This is an actual photograph of the deliberations. And it was really, in the end, engineered by three people. Supposedly, the Allies were to come to terms of the treaty, but Italy rarely showed up at these sessions. Um, the German government was not invited to the sessions where the treaty was written. Neither were the Russians, since they had withdrawn from the war. Neither were the Austrians. And so really, it came down to three world leaders who were in charge of developing this. Uh, Lloyd George of Britain, Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson from the United States, pictured here. Um, they're greeting a crowd outside Versailles um, as this, the deliberations were going on. Here they are seated with the Italian president, um, deliberating on the terms of the treaty. Now, what were they? They were very harsh terms. First of all, Germany had to take responsibility for the war. This was called the War Guilt Clause. Germany and Austria had to agree that they were responsible for the war. Now, as we've seen, that's at best a half-truth. Austria may be more true than Germany, but really, 
these countries were largely caught up in this domino effect that we've already seen. No country actually wanted the war, no country expected the war. Germany had to surrender territory, and it was a significant amount of territory. It added up to about 13% of the German land area. Included in that was, well, the area bordering France, Alsace and Lorraine, which had been seized by Germany in the War of 1870, was transferred back to France. The Rhineland, so the region between the Rhine River and France, was demilitarized, although it remained German territory. The Saar, a particularly rich mining region, um, was under a mandate. It was occupied for 15 years, and at the end of that time, the people in the Saar were to vote about whether they were to become part of France or part of Germany. Also, a large area of eastern farmland was taken to create a new state, Poland. And a corridor was established to the port of Danzig in northern, well, today what it would be Poland, um, had been Germany, leaving East Prussia, an area of Germany that was disconnected from the rest. The Germans lost all colonies in Af Africa and other parts of the world, and they also had to pay reparations. Uh, reparations that eventually were fixed at 132 billion marks. Now, to give you an idea of what that's worth, that would be about, what is, yeah, it's a large number, about half a trillion dollars in today's currency, which for an economy the size of Germany in 1918 was a very large number. Question, yeah? What percent of GDP would that be? What percent of GDP? That's a good question. Because, like, um, it's all relative. Yeah, right. Um, the German economy by the end of the war was in <coughs> such a mess that I've never seen anyone actually estimate that. Um, Pre-war economy, this would have been a large number. Um, Post-war economy, this was probably larger than the GDP. Um, as we'll see, <laughs> well, it was impossible, in a way, for Germany to pay this back. So something odd was created. It was devised to allow them to pay it back, um, which helped to set up the conditions for the Great Depression. But I'll get to that in a moment. Finally, there was a limit to the German army, navy, um, the Navy was not allowed to have submarines. They were limited to 24 ships. The Army was limited to 100,000 men. The draft was abolished. And there was no Air Force. The Germans were allowed to construct aircraft purely for civilian uses, not for any military use at all. Now, to give you an idea of what this looks like on the map, this is the Rhineland that was demilitarized. There is the Saar, which was to be occupied for 15 years and then put up for a boat. Alsace and Lorraine got transferred back to France with their delicious wines. Um, this area, West Prussia and Posen and so on, that became part of Poland. Silesia was given to Poland, which is a very rich mining region. Um, Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria, even though Austrians do speak German, and there was a lot uh, in common between the countries. And there is Weimar, which became the new capital. Now, all of this was perceived as an insult by the Germans, but it was only part of the changes in the map to Europe. Take a look at this map from 1911. This roughly is the way Europe looked before the war. You see this large area that is Austria-Hungary. This is Serbia. Here you have Turkey extending uh, well into Europe. Bulgaria is very small. Romania is just a sliver. Um, there is no Poland. Um, the German Empire stretches all throughout here. Poland has been, for the most part, annexed by Russia. Denmark is significantly smaller than it is today. Actually, part of that area between Germany and Denmark was also given uh, away during these uh, settlements. And this is the region that was later transferred to France. But now, take a look at the map after the Treaty of Versailles. Germany is significantly smaller. Poland has been created as a new nation. Also, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia have been created. Czechoslovakia, carved out of part of what was Germany and mostly what was part of Austria-Hungary. Hungary and Austria are now separate countries. Romania, much larger than it had been. Bulgaria, larger. Turkey is now gone from Europe except for this little chunk. Albania has been created. And Serbia has been enlarged to include uh, a wide variety of areas and is now called Yugoslavia, the land of the South Slavs. Um, some, there's been some border adjustment between Italy and Austria. Uh, anything else? Well, as you can see, East Prussia now is separated from the rest of Germany by that corridor that I was mentioning that becomes part of Poland. Okay, well, all of this was something of a blow to the German spirit, but the Weimar Republic had more against it than that. <laughs> the war debts were really a crushing financial burden initially. Um, it fostered a sense of injustice. Here's a political cartoon from the time where Wilson 
Lloyd George and Clemenceau are leading Germany to the guillotine, <laughs> okay, financially. Um, it fostered a sense of injustice, really, that, wait a minute, the war, yes, you know, everybody suffered in the war. Why was it Germany's fault? Why did Germany have to pay massive reparations? Most of which went to France, but some to Britain and then some to a smattering of other countries, including Italy. Well, suppose you are in charge of a country that is forced to pay large amounts of currency to these people who have defeated you in war, and you don't really have the money to give. Your economy has been destroyed by the war. Uh, your people are starving. What do you do? Print money. Yeah, that's really your only choice. And so Germany began to print money so that more marks were in circulation and it was easier to repay the debt. That led to hyperinflation. Here is the condition, <laughs> the mark in 1918. This is the value of one gold mark in paper marks. In 1919, you can see it start to rise. It rises significantly, tenfold by 1920. Then it stays stable for a while, but you can see that in 1923, it skyrockets. Okay, the paper mark becomes almost completely worthless. Now, here's another way of looking at it. They were printing so extensively, and the, the banks were extending credit so extensively, that the money supply was soaring, and they, as you can see, it tracked the price level very closely. The price level anticipated this. You can see people began to realize what was about to happen before it actually happened, and that began to show up in prices before the supply of marks actually increased. But to give you an idea of what this really meant in human terms, here is the price of a loaf of bread. In 1914, at the beginning of the war, 13 cents, okay? 1916, it's up to 19 cents. So a significant inflation due to the war. Actually, really significant. 1918, it's now 22 cents, almost twice what it had been before the war. 1919, 26 cents. By 1920, it's now $1.20. <laughs> 1921, 135. But look what happens then. January 1923, it's 700 for one loaf of bread. By June, it's 1,200. By September, 2 million. By October, 670 million. <laughs> By November 1st, 3 billion marks. By November 15th, it is 100 billion marks. Okay? Yes. Like it starts extrapolating at some it's, point, right? Because like by then your economy is shut down. That's right. By November 15th, no it one all can estimate stops. cost. Yeah. Exactly. It becomes impossible. Now think about what this sort of thing does. I mean, here are some simple things. Look at this banknote. <laughs> this is a this is a bill, right? That people would carry in their wallets. A 50 million mark bill <laughs> from September 1st. The incredible thing is that by November, this was essentially worthless. What would 50 million marks buy you, after all? when one loaf of bread is going for three billion marks. Okay, that was trivial. That might buy you a slice of bread by that. What happened? People couldn't print the money fast enough to keep up, actually. They developed stamps so that you could just take the old money and stamp it, indicating that it had a new value. This was a 1,000 mark note that was turned into a one billion mark note, but just by that stamp, I mean it at the mark, okay? So people just sort of said, all right, well, do that. The money became so worthless that it was cheaper to let kids play with money <laughs> than to buy some toys. Here are children using stacks of currency as building blocks. Okay, it was cheaper to just give them big stacks of the old money. <laughs> yeah, oh, we got this a month ago. It's now essentially worthless, so go ahead and play with it. Um, here is someone, I mean, where do you store this much money, right? People had to take wheelbarrows to go to the grocery store to buy bread because they had to have that much cash with them. Here you can see a woman who is storing this in a hidden place. She's just got piles and piles of money that she needs to go shopping. Here <laughs> is money is littered in the streets, <laughs> okay? It's so worthless, people won't stoop to pick it up. Now, all of that is pretty extraordinary. Um, here is a woman <laughs> who says, hello, I need work. Okay, and then tells you something about her history and what she's capable of doing. People were desperate. Now, what are the consequences of this kind of hyperinflation? Things really had been bad <laughs> and increasing significantly up until 1923, but then during 1923, it accelerated, and by September, October, November, it was insane. People were insisting on being paid twice a day because the money you got at noon was basically worthless by the end of the day. Um, people would line up and, you know, someone who was working would give another family member who was not working 
uh, the money they earned at noon. So they say, quickly, go out and buy things, because prices were increasing so rapidly that the deal you could get at noon would be you know, very different from 3 o'clock. By 3 o'clock, this money wouldn't buy you anything. So quickly. Now, what does it do to a society? What, it, what does it do to an economy to face that kind of hyperinflation? Nobody's going to save money. Good. Nobody's going to save money, right? No point in saying, I'm not going to spend this now. I'll save it till later. It'll be worthless later. So absolutely, there's no reason to save money. You've got to spend it as quickly as you can. Other consequences. Um, no trust in the market. That's what paper money is kind of doing. That's right. There's no trust. Consider, I give people pieces of paper like this one. <laughs> it's the only one I have. Yeah, philosophy doesn't pay that well. <laughs> but anyway, I have one dollar. <laughs> okay, I can give this to someone, and they give me something for it, right? Now, why do they do that? Because it says the, the government says it's worth that. Right, the government says it's worth something. It says Federal Reserve note on the top, and it says one dollar signed by Timothy Geithner, um, Secretary of the Treasury, issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston in this case. Um, and then, gosh, in the back it has a scary eyeball <laughs> on the top of a pyramid and all sorts of stuff. Um, but it's because of trust, right? You trust that there's something that you can then turn exchange this for. For other goods, you trust that it will be worth something when you turn around and try to use it. Now, if you lose that sense of trust, if you think, wait a minute, the money you're giving me now, an hour from now, two days from now, or even at the early stages of this, a month or two from now, will be worthless, then there's no, not much point to the economic transaction at all, right? So it all depends on a kind of trust and the thought that this will retain some kind of value. And if it doesn't, then we're all in very big trouble and the economy simply shuts down. Other consequences. That's not enough. That, well, that's already really bad, but it gets worse. People, what a, people are going to be starving, once again, because I mean, like, if you can't buy any, you know, like, you, you won't have enough money to get anything. It's not going to work. That's right. I mean, also, as a nation as a whole, the whole nation is going to be pissed off at the rest of the world just because of how bad things have gotten. Okay, good. People are going to be furious over this, right? They're going to be in deep trouble. Um, they, In fact, by November 15th, the economy essentially shut down. The printing presses couldn't go fast enough. It was kind of like it was accelerating so rapidly that money you got now would be worthless a few minutes from now. And so, at the end, exactly, that collapse of trust just meant the economy stopped. Nobody was buying or selling anything. Um, but what does that do? You're right, it undermines trust in the government, it undermines trust in institutions, it leads to anger. Somebody's got to have done this to us, <laughs> and in Germany's case it was pretty obvious who to point fingers at, namely the Western powers, France, Britain, the United States, who were behind the Treaty of Versailles. So yes, it created a great deal of suspicion and hostility toward anybody outside of Germany who was not suffering the same fate. Yeah. It makes it easy to rally people around the false flag. It does make it pretty easy to rally people around a false flag because people are desperate, right? They're saying, look, the money is worthless. How am I going to survive? Now, there are a few people, and, you know, in, in our history as a species, most humans lived in a condition where if things fell apart, they could fend for themselves. <laughs> they knew how to ga gather, hunt, um, grow their own food, and so on. In most modern economies, we don't really know how to do that. The storm recently has made us aware of how... <laughs> Uh, you know, people in large cities, if everything shuts down, if all of a sudden there's no electricity, no transportation, and so forth, how long can most people survive? Well, until the food they happen to have on hand runs out, and then they're in real trouble. They wouldn't be able to get more. What are you going to do in an apartment in Manhattan, decide to start growing your own food in the balcony or something? Um, and so it becomes very difficult. People facing this kind of desperation realize uh, they need some kind of solution and are very willing to follow a leader who promises some kind of solution. Now, I want you to think about another aspect. We've said you wouldn't really save money, right? No point to it. The money will be worthless. What about money you saved in the past? <laughs> oh, you take it out. Yeah, it's worthless, right? Okay, think about the person who actually had money saved up, right? Back in, I don't know, as of January 1923, they had a million marks saved up. They had been working their whole lives. They were getting ready to retire. They thought, man, I've made it. I am now a million now. I have a million marks, I will retire, maybe buy a little farmhouse in the country. And by September, that won't buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> okay? So if they have their money in cash, they're in deep trouble. 
German, the German economy in general was crashing, so if they had stock in some kind of company, they were also in deep trouble. The only thing that might enable them to survive this is hard assets. Gold, or housing, or land, or something, that might retain value. But if you actually have money saved up in any other sort of thing, it was gone, right? Anything you would save, anything that you would set aside for the future, disappeared. And so people's entire life savings were wiped out. So here are some things I've thought of, <laughs> but to add to sort of what you've got, savings, pensions, and so on became worthless. Suppose you had worked your whole life and you retired on a pension of 1,000 marks a month. Well, that's terrific in January. By the end of the year, that's worthless, right? It's, it's not worth walking <laughs> to anywhere to actually cash the check. Most wealth became worthless. There were only a few stores of wealth that managed to persist. Uh, virtues, moreover, that had led to this, right? There was no point to saving any longer, but in the past, the people who had saved, who had set things aside for the future, had been prudent, ended up feeling like chumps. And so virtues of thrift, of prudence, of caution were punished. And in general, you might say, the middle class was destroyed, both literally and figuratively. Literally, because everything they had saved for, everything they had worked for, was now gone. It disappeared. Everyone, essentially, except for a few people who had hard assets, were really in the position of seeing all of their wealth disappear. So the middle class was destroyed, but so was middle class morality. What is middle class morality based on? Work hard to get reward. Good. Partly hope for the future. Partly trust. Partly the thought that if you work hard, you will be rewarded. Right? If you're prudent and save your money, that will be good. That will get you through hard times in the future. It will enable you to pay for your own retirement and all of that. Um, all of that was pointless, right? <laughs> all of that went away. What's the point of hard work if everything you're working for will become worthless? Suppose I told you, yeah, I will hire you today. I will pay you a certain amount. By tomorrow, that amount will be completely worthless. <laughs> right? What's the point of working hard? And so partly people were desperate for work because they needed money to survive, but partly what was the point, right? You had to take it and turn around and use it immediately. So it led to this very short-term outlook. You might say one thing that really is essential to middle-class morality and underlying a variety of the things you've mentioned is this idea of planning for the future, be delaying gratification now and being willing to put it off for the sake of future benefits. But in this kind of circumstance, that is completely insane. There is no future benefit to be counted on. It's better to use things immediately. Have you heard about some of these psychological experiments that people have done where they give a child a marshmallow? And they say, if you, can, if you want, you can eat the marshmallow. But if you wait 10 minutes, I'll give you another marshmallow if it's still there. Okay? Can the child wait 10 minutes to get a second marshmallow? Or do they eat the marshmallow? It's very interesting. Because there are some videos of this, right? The kids are there. Oh, they try to look away and <laughs> try to distract themselves and so on. For a lot of them, it's quite difficult. Anyway, it turns out that the ability to not eat that marshmallow, to delay gratification, has huge impacts on people's later success in life. Uh, if you trace 20 years later, 30 years later, what happens to the kids who were able to resist eating the marshmallow immediately uh, and those who did eat it immediately, it's dramatic. Okay, the kids who can resist eating the marshmallow tend to be much better off. They're the people who were willing to study in school for the sake of some future benefit, who were able to work hard now for the sake of something in the future. Whereas the kids who ate the marshmallow immediately, they tend to be very focused on the short term. And so they don't, in the end, achieve nearly as much. Well, what happens in a condition like this is, basically the kids who delay gratification, they're fools, right? <laughs> and so, really, it's a kind of thing that says there's no benefit at all to doing that. So it destroys any kind of morality that is based on doing something now for the sake of some benefit later. And that's a very fundamental change in perspective. Occasionally, people say, live every day as if it were your last. What, what would you do today if this were really your last day? Suppose you found out you're going to die through the night. Okay, somehow this is revealed to you. God speaks from on high and says, John, enjoy your last day. <laughs> At 4 a.m., you will cease to be. Go to philosophy class. Go to, yeah, would you be here? I mean, honestly, suppose you knew this were your last day alive. Would you be listening to me right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I would do. I'd probably come here and do this and speak to an empty room or something, but... <laughs> Nevertheless, you could sort of think, yeah, 
I wouldn't do any of the things I ordinarily do, right? Well, this kind of short-term perspective that gets promoted by this sort of hyperinflation then leads to all sorts of social chaos. So, in the immediate term, thousands became homeless. Debtors benefited immensely. I borrowed lots of money for you, from you, and it's like, oh, here you go. <laughs> now, easy for me to make two million marks. I can make that in a morning. Um, so debtors benefited a lot. Their debts became worthless. But people who had saved and who had extended loans to people, they were in big trouble. It led to an emphasis on consumption and also an emphasis on hoarding. People realized, tomorrow I don't know if I'll be able to get food, so they tried to get all the food they possibly could then. Go out and spend all that money now and get as much as you can to try to save it in case you can't get anything tomorrow. It destroyed virtually all investments. And the government file finds it's in big trouble too. It can't collect taxes fast enough. Yeah. Like this, this like, I, that's the only food, like, that's the only thing I have. So, everybody desperate for jobs and everything to get some way to survive. Can we affirm that? Okay. Good. Yes, it tends to, I mean, basically, if the ordinary system isn't working, right, then what are people going to resort to? Let's say you find out your money is worthless. Something delays you. By the time you get to the store, you can't buy anything with what you've just been paid for. What do you do? That's funny. Yeah, I mean, here's one thing you can do. Try to steal it, right? Try to steal it from someone else. And so crime increases dramatically. Violence increases dramatically. Basically, people can't accomplish anything in the normal social ways, and they start resorting to ways outside of all of that. And so not only this kind of thing, but all sorts of black market activity, prostitution, um, a variety of things. You know, people start thinking, out, all right, the money's worthless. What else can I sell? Um, and, you know, they become desperate. Yeah. In in more recent years, there have been like huge incidents of hyperinflation, especially in Latin America. And in some countries, the American dollar, for example, has become the de facto or even de jure uh, currency of that country. What prevents something like that happening here? Okay, good. Yeah, you would think that what would happen here is that people would resort to something else for currency. Um, in a lot of war zones, for example, the currency becomes worthless, but people start trading in other things. During the American Civil War in the last, last, later stages, the Confederate dollar became worthless. But did that mean the economy shut down completely? It did cause a lot of problems, but people began trading other things. They found, I mean, in the sort of Second World War movies, GIs trade cigarettes or candy bars or things like that. They become a kind of currency, um, and, and, or the currency from another country. In this case, the Germans didn't have any way of getting currency from another country that they could start using. Um, the whole problem was their markets had been sort of destroyed, and so they weren't able to trade fast enough to get any other foreign currency. And oddly enough, I think because it happened so quickly, there was no way for something else to become a medium of exchange. When things go so out of hand between November 1st and November 15th, there's almost no time to adjust. I think if it had happened more slowly, people could have started trading other things. They could have traded cigarettes, loaves of bread, whatever becomes a kind of available common thing. But because it happened so quickly, nothing like that actually occurred. Yeah. How did they adjust prices like so quickly? Like it was like when you're sitting in a program, like an hour later, you put down a new price, and an hour later, and how did they keep up? How did they know what the overall right price was? That's a good point. I don't know actually, because it would be really a problem. You're right. You'd be ha you'd be in your shop, and you would have to adjust tr prices virtually by the hour, right? It started being each month there would be a new set of prices, then each week, then each day, then you know twice a day, then each hour. And by that point, it's sort of like, wait, wait, people are scrambling to get in the shop because a few minutes might, <laughs> you know, mean your money will no longer buy what you need it to buy. So it is a good question. How did people have any awareness of what was going on? I think so much money was being printed that, you know, the, these people come to the store and they say, I'll, I'll give you a million marks for that. And somebody in comes, in, comes in a few minutes later and says, um, I, look, I've got, I've got five million marks. Uh, to spend and so on, and so it starts happening at an increasing rate. But it is a good question. When it gets this out of control, how do people have any awareness of what's reasonable and what's going on? I think that's part of the reason that by the 15th, it just stopped. People didn't have any awareness any longer. But it's a good question how it went even that far. Well, <clears throat> if the government can't even tax you quickly enough, think about what happens now. Taxes are taken out of a paycheck weekly. Actually, that kind of thing what didn't take place until the Second World War. Withholding was one of the most brilliant schemes, in a way, devised to make people willing to pay taxes because you just never see the money. Before that, before right, like whenever it was, 1944, 
people had to actually write checks to the government. They had to pay taxes physically in some fashion. And so by this time, by the time you were writing the check to the government or bringing the government the cash, it was essentially worthless. And so um, the government would say at the beginning of the month, let's say you owe you know, 5,000 marks, then no problem. A couple of months later when you pay it, <laughs> that's trivial. Um, so nobody was able to borrow. Now, what happened on November 15th? The economy did really fall apart. And the government luckily realized that things were completely out of control. What they did is issue a new currency. They stabilized the economy. And with American help, they implemented what was called the Dawes Plan. The Dawes Plan resumed payments under Versailles, but with borrowed money. Essentially, the Americans said, listen, you can't pay us back, can you? I mean, actually, none of the money was going directly to the United States. It was going primarily to France and to Britain. But they had huge war debts with the United States. And so the United States said, here, we'll loan you the money to pay back Britain and France. Then the Brit British and French received the money and turned around and gave it back to the United States to pay their war debts. And so there was this nice stabilization that worked for a while, okay? It all worked with borrowed American money. Now, there was also an assembly with proportional representation which allowed small parties to elect representatives. And that turned out to be a very, very important change. But here's the Dawes plan. The US loaned Germany money with which it paid back what it owed to the Allies, primarily Britain and France, and then they paid more than the United States. So the money moved around and it all worked until people realized, wait a minute. Right? I mean, wait a minute, what the, what's going on here? It's sort of like you've rented a room from me and you say, you know what, I can't pay the rent. I, I don't have any money. I said, no problem, I'll loan you the money. Then you say, oh, okay, great, here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, does that solve the problem? Not really. And so there's a sense in which this was all an elaborate shell game. Yeah. But there's not, I mean, the U.S. made a one, like a return on their investment, and Germany kept some of the loans. Ah, true, because what happens is, yes, the U.S. loans two and a half billion to Germany. Germany pays two billion back, but they keep half a billion, right? So they now actually have a cushion that they can use for hard currency in their economy. The Allies then pay 2.6 billion in war debt payments. So they're actually paying a significant amount, more than they're receiving from Germany. But nevertheless, they're able to do that because their economies have recovered from the war pretty well. And so what happens really is, yes, you're right. Half a billion gets transferred to Germany. The US takes 0.1 billion, so $100 million, basically on, the, on its loan with the money. And the British and the French are the ones who are really paying that. And so in the end, it's, it all sort of works. Uh, for a while anyway, <laughs> and Germany actually now does have some cash on hand with which it can start to rebuild. Now, the result of that actually was a certain period of social stability and what was Weimar's golden age. It was an age of flowering in the arts and literature. Uh, Bertolt Brecht, Thomas Mann, Franz Kafka, Hermann Hesse. In science, uh, Heisenberg, the development of quantum mechanics occurred during this period. In the arts, Bauhaus, Clay, Ernst, Kandinsky, all were thriving. In philosophy, Heidegger, Husserl, Buber, and also the Berlin and Vienna circles. Most of these people ended up coming to the United States um, once Hitler took over. Karl Hempel, my own teacher, Hans Reichenbach, um, Kurt Gödel, Rudolf Carnap, Moritz Schlick. Schlick is the only one who didn't get out. He was shot by a student um, as he was leaving university one day. And there's a lot of interesting gossip about why. But in any case, since Schlick was Jewish, once the Nazis took over, his assassin was hailed as a hero. Um, then in social theory, Adorno, Weber, the Frankfurt School, in music, Weil, Berg, Schoenberg, Hindemith, lots of very great figures in the arts and in literature and in music. But it was in that context that Hitler actually rose to power. A lot of people think of the hyperinflation as immediately followed by the rise of Hitler. It's not true. Hitler took power in 1933. That was a full decade after things had been stabilized, after the hyperinflation. And during that intervening period, things seemed to be going very well. So how did it happen? Well, at the beginning of this period, you can see the platform that Hitler and the National Socialist Workers Party, which got abbreviated to the Nazi Party, this was the platform. Part of it was racial and nationalist. 
arguing for the unification of all Germans in a greater Germany, essentially to be given back that territory Germany had lost at the end of the First World War, an abrogation of the Treaty of Versailles, a restoration of the land, the territories, the colonies that had been lost, a racial criterion of citizenship. So if you were of German stock and you spoke German, then you could be a German citizen, and an elimination of immigration, the expulsion of immigrants already in Germany. So the idea was Germany for the Germans. That sounds to us repugnant. On the other hand, it followed closely on Wilson's 14 points. In it. He said people should have the right to self-determination. And Hitler was essentially saying, yeah, and this is true for the German people too. Okay? So the German people deserve a country that is there for the Germans. And it really was not that foreign to the way that Wilson and others had been thinking when they remade the map of Europe. There were economic conditions. All were obliged to work. There was to be an abolition of unearned income. So in other words, dividends, interest payments, things like that were simply capital gains, simply to be confiscated. Confiscation of all war profits. Nationalization uh, of all heavy industries. Communalization of warehouses, land reform, expansion of old age welfare and health care. Um, that actually doesn't sound very far from any other sort of socialist platform or from the Communist Party platform. Nevertheless, Hitler was vehemently anti-communist, partly because the communist movement saw itself as international, and this was a nationalist version of the movement. There was also a social political aspect. He wanted national education programs from the beginning of understanding. In other words, from preschool on, the state would educate everyone. He wanted restrictions on the press. He thought that artists, writers, journalists frequently said things that were harmful to society and they needed to be stopped. Um, so all those with a destructive influence on national life were to be banned. Uh, religious freedom was to be permitted if compatible with the state. He said common utility precedes individual utility. So Catholicism, Protestantism, etc. were all okay provided that this, they sort of fit in with the goals of the state. And then the unlimited authority of a strong central power. Well, this changed somewhat over time, but that was the initial platform. Now, Hitler tried to implement this. It didn't attract much support uh, electorally, but he tried to implement it in uh, a coup, really, at the Munich Beer Hall Putsch in November of 1923. This was, as you can see, in, right in the midst of that period of hyperinflation. Did it succeed? No. It failed spectacularly. He was arrested and imprisoned, sentenced to four years in jail. He didn't serve all four years, but nevertheless, he was sentenced to four years in jail for this insurrection. And in jail, he wrote his masterwork, Mein Kampf, which remains illegal in many European countries. Okay? You can find copies on the web, but it is still outlawed in a variety of places. What does he argue for? Well, he says there are two great evils in the world. Judaism and communism. And he thinks that there is nevertheless a third way of dealing with things that goes beyond those two, that is beyond communism, beyond capitalism, and he takes the Jews as emblems of capitalism. Um, he says, no, there will be a third way, and that's one, in, one of the meanings of third Reich. It partly means the third kingdom, the third realm, but it can also mean the third way. He says, a great leader is somebody who can lead essentially irrational crowds <coughs> through propaganda, and he supplements a kind of Marxist class analysis with race. He says, the whole history of the world isn't just a history of class struggle. It is a history of racial and ethnic struggle. And so he wants to emphasize racial purity and the struggle for power that he sees various races and various ethnic groups as involved with. He basically says everybody is involved in a kind of Darwinian struggle for survival and power. And it pits race against race, ethnicity against ethnicity, nationality against nationality. What must you do? Struggle to prevail. Here is Churchill's summary. Man is a fighting animal. Therefore, the nation, being a community of fighters, is a fighting unit. Any living organism which ceases to fight for its existence is doomed to failure and extinction. A country or race which ceases to fight is equally doomed. The fighting capacity of a race depends on its purity, hence the need for ridding it of foreign defilements. What's wrong with Judaism? Now, this is actually an important historical question, I think. Jews have been targets of uh, prejudice, of violence, over the centuries, time and time again. Why? What is it that leads, in this case, Hitler, to take the Jews as the punching bag, 
but has led so many people historically to take Jews as punching bags. Well, with Hitler, when he was in World War I, weren't the Jews weren't allowed to fight in World War I, right? Or were they on the outside of the Germans? Were they? I don't know. Because oh, like when it, I don't know, like uh, when he was like injured during World War One, he came. He was behind the lines in Germany, and he saw the Jews like running the shops and like running the banks and stuff like that. Uh, and that made him hate them because he thought it was like this scheme for them to. Ah, right. If we go back to that, that uh, yeah, so when he platform. When he was injured, and he saw a lot of Jews behind the lines and stuff. Notice confiscation of all war profits. He looks at yeah, who is somehow making money. Now, there's a, here's the historical background to this in a way. Jews were so frequently persecuted in their home countries that they were able to do only certain limited subsets of things. And in particular, they often got involved in international trade and in banking and in a few other things that enabled them to thrive despite being persecuted in their home countries. So there was something international about Judaism. Now, from a communist point of view, you might think, well, communist is an, communism is an international movement, so that's fine. But Hitler's movement is a strongly nationalistic movement. That makes him suspect anybody who can't be identified with the particular country in which they exist. Jews, insofar as they have this other identification, this other transnational, international identification and, uh, and loyalty, he sees as an element that is really contrary to the, the purity of his state, but really, in a certain sense, any state. So to some extent, you're right, due, due to historical persecutions for a variety of reasons, Jews had moved into areas that made them immune from some of the fighting, of, uh, or some of the consequences of World War I, but it was also a fact that, in a sense, anybody who claimed allegiance to anything else was a potential source of trouble for his vision. So who else would that be? Who, for example, in Germany would have an allegiance to someone outside of Germany, to something other than the German people? Well, gypsies. Who else? Communists. Communists. Yes, they had allegiance to this international movement. Who else? Any immigrants, but also Catholics. Yes, Catholics would have an allegiance to the Pope, right, to the Catholic Church. And so actually all of those became suspect groups. It wasn't just Jews. Jews got to be number one on the list. But really, once you get going on this, you realize, wait a minute, who has an allegiance to something other than the folk, the, the people here? Well, gosh, anybody who has this additional allegiance for religious reasons, for ethnic reasons, um, for ideological reasons, any of those groups then become targets. So, when he's released from prison, which is in December of 1924, he serves just over a year, he then allies himself with Gregor Strasser and Joseph Goebbels in 1925. He takes control of the Nazi party almost immediately, and then he uses it to further his own aims. Now, initially, it stands for a socialist working class revolution. But it's strongly anti-Jewish, it's strongly anti-communist, partly because they have allegiance to some, something other than the German state. Why aren't Catholics on the list? Well, there are too many of them. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so you can't really stir up you know, a huge part of the electorate against itself. It's got to be a fairly small group you can target, um, as well as anti-Weimar, and so he argues in favor of this thing he calls the Third Reich, the Third Kingdom of the Germans, but also the Third Way. Now, things were in bad shape, but by 1929, there was prosperity. Things were going well. It was still below the pre-war levels. Germany in 1929 was not as successful, not as prosperous as, as it had been in 1914, but still things were going pretty well. Here's a picture of, of the sort of scene in Weimar, as at least portrayed in the movies. And indeed, in 1928, the Nazis got less than 3% of the vote. Okay, they did not have any significant popular appeal. But then something happened, and it changed the nature of their popular appeal dramatically. What? The Wall Street crash. Exactly. The 1929 crash and the Great Depression that followed. Okay? And in particular, what devastated the German economy was the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. It made international trade, which was how Germany was getting its money, it made it very difficult, it shrunk it, and so it led to desperation. German unemployment had been relatively low by the late 20s, but by 1931, it was over 33%. By 1932, it was almost 44%. Okay, those are extraordinary levels, worse than things ever got at the worst point of the Depression in the United States. 
Germany was so heavily dependent on trade, it was now in real trouble. Uh, yeah. U6 unemployment, or is that that's actual? That's 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 the U6 number. Basically, it's only been relatively in recent decades that people have not included people who haven't been applying for jobs in the last month. So yeah, that's the bigger number. But nevertheless, this is an astronomical number. Well, at this point, the Nazi movement began to become much more popular. Now, who were its chief supporters? Who were the first ones to line up behind Hitler? Unemployed workers? You might think the unemployed workers, but actually that wasn't true. Who so, wasn't? The soldiers were the first. Uh, the soldiers? Them. Not really. And the bankers. Look in a mirror. It was the student movement. It was the universities. Actually, both the faculty and the students who were his main base of power. This was a sort of intellectual movement, believe it or not. It was, the students were largely Nazi by 1930. Many professors were Nazis. When Hitler took over, he gave an order that all Jewish faculty be fired. And really, within the universities, there was almost not a squeak of protest. Um, most of the professors, most of the students were Nazi by this time. There was a partnership with an industrialist, so he got certain powerful industrialists on his side. In 1930, he got 18 percent of the vote. By 1932, 37 percent. The Nazis and communists together had more than half. Hindenburg refused to make Hitler chancellor, even though his party got more votes than anyone else. But he took power shortly thereafter. Now, what was the attraction of all this? Why? Where did the, these ideas come from? After all, this is, of course, on ideas of the 20th century. Well, in part. There were images in Nietzsche. Now, let me be careful to say, Nietzsche is not a Nazi. I'm going to blame a little bit of this on Kant. Kant was certainly no Nazi. But there were images in Nietzsche that he could seize upon and use for, take for as inspiration. The relativism, the historicism. There's this image in Nietzsche of the blonde beast going out over the plains in seek of weaker prey. All of that went into nicely his thought that we are born for struggle, and the strongest one will be the one to survive. And so he glorified strength. He had this image of Rome versus Judea. Notice Judaism was the enemy for Nietzsche, and vision of Roman strength, that was the ideal. Hitler took that over. There was also this idea from Nietzsche and Heidegger that authenticity is what you really value. The ultimate moral value is being who you are. Well, if who you are is a blonde beast, then let it out, man, <laughs> okay? This kind of struggle, this strength, this victimization of others is actually a positive thing to be admired. And, well, I won't go into, yeah, that's just the blonde beast passage, but actually maybe I should read you this. They, these blonde beasts, enjoy freedom from all social control. They feel that in the wilderness they can give vent with impunity to that tension which is produced by the enclosure and imprisonment in the peace of society. Uh, they revert to the innocence of the beast to prey conscience, like jubilant monsters who perhaps come from a ghastly bout of murder, arson, rape, and torture with bravado and moral equanimity, okay? As merely some wild student's prank had been played. Nietzsche's holding that up as an admirable moral ideal, and that's something that Hitler takes and says, yeah, that's exactly the right moral ideal. Now that is not, I think, ultimately what Nietzsche takes as his ideal. That's a stage on the road for him, but for Hitler that becomes the end point, that becomes the goal. And so, the magnificent blonde beast roaming of the plains, rampant for spoil and victory, that's precisely his ideal. The other thing lurking in the background is Kant's idea of a kingdom of ends, okay, which in the German is a Reich of Zecke, a Reich of ends. His idea is basically, we think about a situation where, now in Kant it means we all value each other as ends in ourselves. We value every human being's dignity. But Hitler twists that into something very different. He twists it into something that says, we must all have a common end. And anyone who does not fully share our common ends has to go. And that becomes something Kant never intended, but nevertheless a twist on this vision of a right, of ends where we share certain common values, that becomes quite pernicious. Next time we'll take a look at how Hitler begins to implement this internally and then externally.